My name is Carol Reese. I'm a Rutherford County Master Gardener and I have been for 18 and a half years. We're here at the Senior Center and I'm greatly looking forward to uh, giving this little talk. We're going to talk first of all about right plant, right place. When you plant anything and when you plant anything in Tennessee, uh, the things you most want to be concerned about are light availability, intensity and duration. Anything up to four hours of sunlight a day, full sunlight, is considered partial shade or partial sun, whichever you want to do. You can, that, that requirement is something that's, that your plant will need. Anything from six to eight hours of full sunshine a day is considered full sun. You will know if your plant is not getting enough sun because the plant will elongate between the nodes. That's where your leaves come out, it's at your nodes. That's where your branches come out, it's at the nodes. When your plant overly elongates between the nodes, it causes the stem to weaken. When the stem weakens, it, uh, it's susceptible to breakage. That's especially important with things that have a big head, like a hydrangea, like a viburnum. Because if that head's out here and that stem's not strong enough to support them, the, the whole thing falls over. And that's not what you want in a lands landscape plant. Um, so uh, you can grow plants in, in shade, partial shade, full shade, either one. Uh, but you have to pick the plant specific to the conditions you're going to expose it to. Um, plants need water. And water availability is an issue wherever you might put them. Um, if you if you're not going to get enough rain, if you're in an area that doesn't get enough rain or you're next to a creek or you're next to a, a little rivulet of water, be sure to be able to either hand carry or take a hose and water those plants. This is very important in the first two months to one year of life. It's very important for some plants more than others. Your hydrangea is going to need a good bit of water. Your witch hazel is going to need a good bit of water. If you have any questions about such things, look to where the witch hazel grows naturally. You'll never see a wood, witch hazel uh, growing by itself any place but near a stream bed where it gets partial sun and a lot of water. Um, exposure to wind and temperature extremes. When you plant a plant up next to your house or in a copse of woods where the wind is going to not blow it constantly, um, that's called a microclimate. If you put it out in the open, the wind's going to blow it much more regularly and with much more intensity. When the wind blows your plant, it's sucking the moisture right out of it. So keep in mind that if you have a plant that needs to maintain a little bit higher level of moisture, put it in a microclimate. Your camellias do well in uh, slightly wooded, sheltered areas. Your azaleas do better in slightly wooded, sheltered areas. That can be in the woods, that can be up against your house. Anything with a shiny leaf is a little bit more capable of maintaining a moisture level. Anything with an evergreen leaf is capable when you see a leaf on a camellia or a, um, an evergreen, uh, a, uh, a broadleaf evergreen, not a needled evergreen, that has brown spots on it in the wintertime or brown edging in the wintertime, that means that that plant was not getting the amount of moisture that it needed, sucked up out of the soil because the water was locked in the soil from winter freezing temperatures and the plant is damaged subsequently because the wind took the moisture right out of the plant. Um, soil type is a consideration. Clay soil uh, produces very nice plants. You just gotta convince the clay to let loose of the nutrients in the soil. Clay soil has a ton of nutrients in it. You just have to put enough organic material into the soil to loosen it. Sand soil has very few nutrients in it. You'll hear a lot of people say that the way to loosen up clay soils is to add sand. Now, if you go talk to a concrete person, they will tell you that the way to make 
concrete is to have a clay substrate and add sand. Your, what you need to add is your organic material. That's peat, that's moss, that's core, that's uh, manure, that's straw, that's shredded leaves. Anything that's organic and will break down. The, the bad side of that is that when that stuff breaks down, it disappears. So you're constantly replenishing. Not constantly, it's not a burden, but you'll, you'll be replenishing that organic material all the time. You want to make sure you pay attention to your hardiness zone. Uh, this is sp uh, particularly important when you're putting plants in pots. Plants in pots are exposed to more heat in the summertime and more cold in the wintertime because their root ball's not down in the ground. It's sitting in this container that's up. So be sure that the plant you put in a pot can withstand those extremes. The same thing with the plant you put in the soil. If you love a plant so much, and it's supposed to be a perennial, but you put it in a hardiness zone where it cannot su survive the winter, then what you have done is taken that perennial and putting it into an annual set of conditions for growth. If that's what you want, fine. I've planted palm trees because I like them that much, knowing that they were gonna die that winter and I was not gonna be able to bring them in. Competition from existing vegetation. The part of the plant that you see is not competing, but the part of the plant underground is looking for nutrients in the soil and water and air in the soil. So those roots are headed out. Usually they go to the drip line from the green area of the plant, but they're competing with all the plants around them for those very same nutrients. Be aware of that when you put that plant in the ground. Um, below ground conditions in urban sites include power lines, uh, <coughs> fiber lines, computer lines, phone lines, um, Pay attention to what's underground as well as what's above ground. And then above ground wires or obstructions. When you plant a plant under a power line and it gets to be the same height as the power line, there's gonna be a pruning event conducted by the Middle Tennessee Electric Co-op. Don't be upset. Aesthetic considerations for choosing your landscape plants. Growth habit. Landscape plants come in columnar, pyramidal, circular, make sure to choose the one that you're most interested in. That we're right back to right plant, right place. Um, there are some columnar plants that are recently developed. I have seen columnar oaks. They're oak trees, 20, 30 feet tall. They're about as big around as this table. Uh, they're, the place I've seen them the most often is in the parking lot at um, Walmart. You can find a tree that fits the space you want to fill without any trouble at all. You, you can find a tree that fits the space you want to uh, fill. Season of bloom. There's a certain joy in having a plant blooming every season of the year. And if you pay attention, you can find a plant that will bloom in your yard all year long. Uh, benefits to wildlife. When you plant a native plant or something that's got edible berries, you'll encourage the birds to come into your area. Uh, when you plant an evergreen plant, especially a needled evergreen, they keep cover all winter long and all year long and, and you'll have uh, birds and other things, squirrels and whatnot. If you have squirrels, you'll have hawks. So it's the circle of life. Uh, fall color. If you're into fall color, then you plant the, the plants that will give you that fall color. Your maples, your Japanese maples, um, your uh, cottonwoods, uh, your uh, gum trees. I'm looking at run, one right now. Um, that's what you go for. Your oak trees are not gonna drop their leaves until next spring, so they're not gonna, you're not gonna get much fall color out of an oak. Size matters, perspective matters, evergreens, deciduous, deciduous and needled. Uh, deciduous trees that lose their leaves in the fall. Coloration. Grays, you can get that from your uh, dogwoods. Oh, okay. Cornus racemosa, that's a gray dogwood. You can pick up gray coloration from that. Grays are a popular right now, especially in your landscape, your uh, perennials uh, and in a lot of houses. 
So uh, it's really popular in the florist industry for your grays, your artemisia, uh, your limes. That's the lime color in your redbud, the Circes canadensis. Your greens, reds, in Photinia species, they're all green and red. They have a red edge. Uh, Burgundy, Circes canadensis, again, eastern redbud. Um, bronzes, in your evergreens, you have magnolias that are green on the uh, top side. Bronze on the bottom side, they're very attractive. In a wind, you'll get flashes of, of uh, the green and the burgundy, or the bronze. Golds, many evergreens, especially your um, Asian evergreens, will have gold tips. Threadleaf uh, bush, um, Cami cypress has a lot of gold tips on the edge of the things. And then your yellows, golden rain tree. That was planted at uh, Patrick Henry's home too. I don't think it's, a, I think he imported it. I don't think it's a uh, heritage plant, but uh, I so yeah. I think Jefferson planted it too. Here's one of them. Here's one of the plants that is highly recommended for this area. That would be beautyberry. The, the leaves on beautyberry are insignificant. The plant um, is native, berries eaten by the birds. It takes full sun, but it can also take a little bit of shade. Found in the southeastern states. Uh, typically, you'll find it at three to six foot tall, depending on how much, uh, how the other factors affecting it. How much soil does it have to travel through? How many nutrients is it getting? But I, you can get it as high in this area as nine feet. Um, it's deciduous, but those little purple berries circle the branches all the way around at each node over the whole tree and it is glorious and you'll see it now in the fall you, you'll see it and those berries hang on into the winter a little bit so they they give you a tr interest all the way into the winter uh camellia it or camellia camellia uh, i don't know how to pronounce it um it's not native to the united states it's from asia there is a, a camellia, camellia that grows and blooms in the fall and there's one that blooms in the spring. The leaves are glossy. They stay glossy all winter long. They're, it's very attractive. It's a good place for birds to hide when they want to get away from the wind. Uh, it's acid loving. It does very well close to your azaleas and your rhododendrons. Um, you fertilize after the spring bloom and then again in the summer. It's an evergreen um, and it needs shelter from harsh winds and sun. This is a plant that you put in a courtyard up close to your house. It, doesn't grow much further north than here. It, it likes it. It likes it hotter. Likes it, and it likes the humidity that it would find. When you th when you think about plants, think about where they came from originally and where they're growing all by themselves. Mm -hmm. That would be um, Asia, where it's moist and it's warm pretty much all the time. And camellias come in all colors. That well, they don't come in purple, but they do come in whites and pinks, um, reds, and a real nice rosy red. Viburnum. This is your snowball bush. It's evergreen, semi-evergreen, and deciduous. You can get, there's three different types. Full sun to partial shade. You'll see this growing in the springtime. Well, you see the, you'll see it growing all the time, but you'll see the blossoms in the springtime. And it, they, they're incredible. They're incredible. And this plant can get 20 foot tall. Uh, blooms similar to lace cap, lace cap or snowball but mostly snowball for your viburnums. The fragrance of a viburnum will knock you off your feet. It's, uh, if you get a, a good enough, uh, it's uh, viburnum, uh, Davidii is one cultivar, and I can't remember the other one. Davidii, will, the, the smell will absolutely drop. Mm -hmm. uh, they, the blossoms last a long time. Witch hazel, this is a great plant. And the reason it's a great plant is because it blooms in the uh, late fall, early spring, or, and it will bloom in the winter time. It's a beautiful plant. The blooms look like that. They never get real big, but it still gives you that winter interest. Comes in an orange, comes in a yellow. Some of the witch hazels are, norm, are naturally occurring in the United States or in North America, but a lot of them can also be imported from where they originated in Asia. So it, it natu it's, it's native here, but it's also from Asia. So I don't know when it came over on its own, compliments of a bird. 
um, prefers moist so soil. This will grow next to, in more moist soil, next to a riverbed, next to a stream bed. It likes a little bit of shade. Uh, and the bark is used to make a remedy for skin ailments. That's where the original witch hazel ointment, witch hazel uh, tisane, uh, a liquid came from. It's an astringent, uh, slightly disinfectant. And it's found in nature along stream banks in full sun to model shade. Here's your hydrangea. All hydrangeas grow well here if they get enough water. And the most important watering period is uh, up to a year. Yeah. Once, once, if you can get them past the year mark, you, you, you gotta, you're a little bit ahead of the game. Mop head hydrangeas have the big old ball and then panicle looks, it's flat like this. Moist soil and um, you have to be careful when you prune the hydrangea because some of them bloom on second year growth and some of them bloom on first year growth. So make sure that you pay attention to which is which when you plant them so that you don't accidentally prune them and cut off next year's growth, uh, blossoms. Japanese maple, fantastic plant. It'll grow in a pot. Um, it'll grow up next to the house. It does not like full, full, full sun. It'll burn it. If you do have a Japanese maple, and again, that they get spectacular color. If you do have a Japanese maple, be sure not to prune the leaves off the top of the plant in the summertime. So when you prune, make sure you don't have any bark that's naked at the top because the sun will burn the bark oh. and cause it to split. You want to you want to make sure that that bark is always covered with something so it doesn't get sunburned. Here's another picture of a Japanese maple. See how they they've made sure that the leaf mm, cover nice. is all over the top of that plant. Here's your red bud. Moist soils, good drainage. It's a robust tree in this area, native, and will grow with a very shallow soil. This is also a legume. When you see that, you know that that plant is fixing nitrogen in the soil. So you put other plants around it and they'll take advantage of that nitrogen. There are several varieties. You're talking about the common one, mm -hmm. the, just the plain green one. There's also a purple, burgundy, purplish leafed one, and a lime green leafed one. Neither one of those are as vigorous or robust as the the common one so uh, but if you want summer interest in a green leaf or summer interest in a the burgundy leaf then you can look to do plant something like that dogwood there's your dogwood uh, yeah. moist moist fertile soil again if once you get it past that first year you're and there's two types of dogwood there's this one and then there's another one that is uh, Cornus floridia. That one is more of a shrub. It doesn't grow up and then out. It grows more yeah. rounded. That one um, is, is, doesn't get anthracnose like this one does. This one will get anthracnose. You'll notice it right away if the leaves look mm. virusy, like they, they, they start to die in the summertime. They'll have a red edge little cast on it and um, so dogwood's actually one of the trees that it's best not to plant dogwood 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 because if one of them gets anthracnose they'll all get anthracnose um, don't damage the bark of this uh, dogwood because uh, it allows borers to invade that's another point whenever you mulch around plants you want to make sure not to have your volcano mulches you know um, that's a term that gardeners use uh, you'll see mulch where they, they just put the mulch on and they pile it up next to the, the bark of the trunk. Well, what that does is it allows mice and other critters to live in there. And over the winter, when the mice are hungry, they're gonna go eat the bark. They'll chew through the bark of the tree. Make sure that the area right next to the bark of the trunk of the tree is not got a bunch of mulch piled up. Just pull it back a couple inches. Okay. Um, you can grow them in containers, part shade, full, but I've seen them do very well here in full sun. Uh, fertilize lightly. 
Uh, this is another tree with winter interest. It gets those pretty little red berries just, you know, right on the tips where the flowers were. And right, right about now. Fringe tree. This is uh, what Jack was showing you a picture of. This is um, Chianenthus virginiana, I think, or virginica. Sorry, my brain's not what it used to be. Um, it's a native plant. Grows 12 to 20 feet. Tolerates air pollution in urban settings. It is glorious. If you put it in your yard, people will be asking you all the time, what is that tree? What is that tree? What is that tree? But only when it blooms, because once it blooms, nobody's interested. It's kind of nondescript. Harry Lauder walking stick. Yeah, I don't care much for that one. Uh, this is a weak tree, but um, it's so interesting, especially in the wintertime. People love to look at this kind of Grow a little bit here, grow a little bit here, grow a little bit here, grow a little bit here. So it does have winter interest, um, but it is not hardy. I just had to, I just took one down because yeah. it's just not, it, it was only about eight years old. It, it, it wasn't thriving, but I don't have any soil. You live in a land with soil. Um, primarily inter winter interest, it is in the Filbert family. So uh, that's where you get your little catkins can be trained to a single trunk, so it doesn't always look like a shrub. Eight to 10 feet tall, six to eight foot wide, native to England, full sun, partial shade. Low concentration fertilizer, moist soil the first two years after that, it will tolerate dry conditions. Azalea, partial shade, um, wonderful colors. It's an evergreen, it's a broadleaf evergreen. People around, now, here's a caveat. People around here for a long period of time said that the azalea needed to not be wet, wet feet. So what they ended up doing was they would plant, take the plant out of the pot and they would plant it a couple inches above the soil level. Some of them went so high as to plant the, the, the root ball this high. All those plants died. Uh, that plant knew that it needed to be in the soil, but the landscaper evidently did not. Um, so don't plant. When, when you talk to landscapers, or if you have them planted, or if you plant them, don't plant them up out of the soil. This would be your evergreen azalea, not your deciduous. Um, if you got enough soil and good enough growing conditions, that plant can get as high as eight to 10 foot tall. Uh, there's another plant that's very similar also that requires the same condition. This likes acid soil, so you might have to hit it with some acid. There are acid treatments for your soil that are organic, depending on how you feel. You don't have to worry about doing organic or inorganic. So this, you can, you can use, uh, I think there, I'm not allowed to recommend a brand name, but because of, because technically we volunteer for the state, but there are organic treatments for the soil that will acidify for, and they're food for, or nutrients for azaleas. Here's the one that's very similar. It's a rhododendron. They're related, uh, leads, needs a little bit more shade. So if, you're sh if you decide that the, sh the spot you're looking at is more shade than what the azalea will like, um, this is it. And this gets even bigger than the, rhodo than the azalea. There is a huge display of azalea and rhododendron growing at the Huntsville Botanical Garden, if you ever are at Huntsville? Huntsville Botanic Garden, if you ever get, now there's no flowers on them now, unless they're the reblooming azaleas, but there is a very nice azalea walk. Uh, this is the crab apple. Your deer will love you, love you if you plant crab apple. But yeah, these are good plants and they do make a nice jelly. Here's your crepe myrtle. Yeah, there's your crepe myrtle. It'll tolerate your clay soil. You water, again, water when it's young and then it's pretty much not a problem. Full sun, uh, most beautiful flowers, you, you, little or no pr pruning is required and you'll get a lot of suckering if you do prune a lot. Small crepe myrtles that just get three to four feet tall. Yeah, you don't see the trunk now, you're not gonna see the trunk a lot of the time on the, the smaller crepe myrtles, but you will see the flowers. And that's and, really what I wanna see. Yeah. And they're really great. It's one of the reasons I love them so much is because they're called the Dazzle series. So it, they named them Razzle Dazzle and Strawberry Dazzle. And I just think that's so cool that they, they, they're the Dazzle series. Um, and the smaller varieties you can grow in a, in a container if you so choose. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, pink, dark pink, red, purple, white. 
great plant. Blueberries, you can plant blueberries in your landscaping if you so choose. Uh, boxwood, evergreen, sometimes variegated. It, it, when it's variegated, it grows in a pyramid form. It's fantastic, beautiful flower arrangements. Uh, over time though, they will get a blight. It's called boxwood blight. Uh, good look for a formal hedge, suitable for containers. Dwarf Yapon Holly. This is an evergreen that has red berries. Uh, grows very well here. All the hollies grow very well here. Um, can be planted any time, full sun, partial shade, up to four foot, any type of soil, minimal pruning, just, just to keep it shaped up. Um, and when you do prune, never just prune the outside. You want to reach in and take stuff out of the middle because if, if, you, if you just prune the outside, you'll end up with just greenery on the outside and dead sticks on the, in the middle of the plant. Uh, bright red berries, and they're attract the birds love the berries on that. Now, uh, laurel plants, these grow in the woods. You, they're, they're prob you're probably surrounded by laurels, not this particular variety, but out in your woods, uh, they grow great here. And you can get this flowering one if, if this is the kind of look you're going for. Low maintenance, this is very low maintenance. Um, especially, look at, look at the growth habit. Bigger on the bottom, come stepping up into the inside. Yeah, if, if you don't wanna work, this is a good one. Doesn't sound like you're averse to work though, because you got a big old garden. <laughs> um, moist soils, three foot tall, six foot wide, and spring flowers followed by summer fruit. Dwarf Buford holly, Burford holly, excuse me. Uh, again, the hollies do fantastic here. And there's variegated hollies too, if you're interested in that look, the green and white, green and white. I'm a florist, so I, I, Aesthetics are very important to me when I'm looking at stuff in the, um, so yeah. Beautiful red berries, little or no pruning. Japanese yew, partial to full sun, water weekly. Um, price for its foliage, many shades of green. So this is where you get your gray greens and your green greens and your uh, lime greens in plants like this, plum yew. There's your golds, glow barber vitae. Partial to full sun, water regularly, small, vibrant con conifer, four foot tall, smaller in a container unless the container is quite large. Emerald spread, there's your U again. It's got a smaller needle on the branch of the plant and a gold cast to the uh, foliage. Not suitable for containers though. It evidently gets way too big. Look, eight to 10 foot wide. Dwarf conifers. Um, whenever you have a plant that is, inf it, for some reason, and you may not even realize it, whenever you have a plant that's infected by a virus, a lot of times it'll throw off mutations. It's called a witch's broom, where you get an evergreen, and all of a sudden it's got this little bunch of smaller evergreen growing out of one spot. It's a mutation. It's a response to a virus. Um, those plants are typically dwarf. So you have a conifer that's like this with a witch's broom. You take those off and you root them. And when you plant them in the ground, they, never, they grow an inch a year. They're only about this big. It's a dwarf conifer. They're exactly the same plant, but they're dwarfed because they mutate. Um, dwarf Japanese cedar, minaret dwarf bald cypress, Kami cypress, obtusa nana lutea, and a dwarf alcock spruce. I've had dwarf Kami cypresses growing in my yard before. Not here, I have too much rock. Kami cypress and a lot of your evergreens need a lot of soil. You have soil, I have rock. <laughs> <laughs> and, and replacing rock is very expensive. <laughs> Container gardening. All plants can be incorporated into the garden or landscape in a container, just depends on the size of the container. You know, when you put in a raised bed into your yard, that's essentially a container. If cold intolerant, must be housed in the winter. Uh, the rules for container planting, I don't know if you're into presentation, but you'll, you'll notice that most, most commercial or horticulture places like Cheekwood Botanic Garden or Huntsville, whenever they plant a container, uh, they usually uh, plant a, they call it a thriller, which is something tall a filler, which something fills up the, the pot, and it could be multiple plants, 
and then a spiller which is something that tumbles out of the pot and crawls down the side okay uh, container if you, if you don't have enough space in one container to do the thriller filler and spiller you can always put multiple containers together you can put one container with a thriller one container with a filler one container with a spiller or whatever variation you desire um, it, it aesthetically it's very pleasing to see that um, I'm just going to go fall garden pests. These are stuff that uh, pops up on your fall vegetable garden. That'll be your cabbage worm, cabbage looper, aphids, spiders, and ants. Ants are the biggest problem in, or let's start at the beginning. This is your cabbage worm. It's going to eat your coal crops, anything you got going in the... In, yeah, we dust them okay. regularly. Yeah, yeah. There's your cabbage looper. Um, aphids, ants tending aphids. Yeah, um, like aphids cannot, once they land, they fly. When they hatch, they fly. Once they land on your plant and start sucking the juices out of it, um, if you, uh, one of the ways to get rid of them is to spray them with a hose. Once they get, when they land on your plant and start eating it, they lose their wings. So if you knock them off onto the ground, they got to walk back. And that's a deterrent. I'm not saying there won't be more aphids flying in, but the best way to get rid of them, the first step in getting rid of them is to spray them with a hose and water. blast them off. In water. Yeah. Uh, that, these are aphids. That right there, you know how they say use ladybugs to get rid of aphids? It works very well. But the ladybug itself is not what's eating the aphid. The ladybug will eat a few. But that's the larval form of the ladybug. So when you see it on your plants, leave it. Don't, don't think that that's another pest. That's the guy that's going to eat those aphids. And that's a, that's a larval form of the ladybug. So there you go. And as a rosarian, you're going to have quite a few aphids. Hmm. We don't, uh... And there we go. That's it. Thank, thanks for listening to us this uh, small interlude. We hope that we brought you some information that you might be able to use. Um, greatly appreciate you listening. Thank you.